Heavenly Father, we uh, come before you as we sang. We come on, uh, before uh, you, the only holy God. And we know that your holiness and your righteousness is beyond our ability to comprehend. Uh, we think of uh, the prophet who, seeing your glory, says, Behold, I'm a man of unclean lips, of unclean people. And yet you, through your son, through the message of what Jesus did to save sinners and restore us to God, you call unholy people to yourself. And Lord, what a beautiful message that is. What a beautiful hope we have. And so we pray that those who know that hope might live in light of it. Those who have not that hope might see it and hear it and respond to it. We pray all this in your name. Amen. My guess is that most of you uh, have heard of the San Andreas Fault whether through uh, film or through history. Uh, it's particularly uh, referenced because of its geological instability. The fault line stretches for nearly 800 miles along the California coast, and it's estimated that along that line are uh, over 5,000 earthquakes a year. Most of those earthquakes are relatively minor, but some, like the ones in 1906 or 1989, have been catastrophic. And the fault line follows the meeting point of the two largest of the tectonic plates. And they rub up against each other, and it creates this friction and this tension that at some point inevitably erupts into an earthquake. The energy's got to go somewhere. And so scientists have identified particular hot spots along that, which seem to be where Californians want to live, uh, and often why they move up here. Uh, and so they know these particular hot spots areas, and they try to account for it with building codes and with development plans. But recently, the biggest concern for geologists are the areas where there has been no activity, no earthquakes for hundreds of years. Because it's in those spots, invisible to the naked eye, where pressure and energy from those plates moving have been building up for centuries. And the concern is that one day all of that energy will erupt and they will have no way to prepare for it or to know when it's going to happen. And when Christians come to faith in Jesus Christ, when we are converted, we know that there will be places of tension between the plates of our heart in Christ and the plates of the world. Sometimes those fault lines are well noticed. They're to be expected. We feel that tension when it comes to being people of faith in a world of sight. We feel the tension when it comes to the weight of exclusivity that we preach Christ and him crucified, him crucified in a world that is pluralistic, saying anyone can come anyway, however they want, to whomever God they pray to. We feel that weight when we look at biblical love as we examine in the book of Song of Songs, and we try to embody that and live that out in the face of a world that has an over-sexualized and lost identity. Sometimes those fault lines are obvious. Sometimes those fault lines are more hidden. In the world, they're often very clear. But sometimes we encounter those points of tension in our own hearts, and we are not prepared for the friction. So the question is, for the threats both external and internal, how, if you are a Christian, do you prepare? How, if you're considering the weight of the gospel, do you consider the tension of salvation? Can we prepare? Or are we kind of like the poor pitiless souls in those hidden spots along the fault line, just hoping that it doesn't happen to them? That by blind chance and by white knuckled will, they'll make it through. Well, today, after a series in Song of Songs, we return to the book of Acts. And the tectonic plates are changing. The church is now bursting forward out of Jerusalem and it's going out into the broader world and there are new points of friction, there are new tensions, there's new energy building. And as we examine those pinch points in the text, pinch points of Christians and the world and Christians in their own heart, we get insight into what to expect for our own church, for our own lives, those fault lines both hidden and revealed. And so our main point is just gonna be this, the word of God crosses the dividing lines of our world and of our hearts. 
The word of God contains the message of God, the good news that Jesus did everything required to save sinners and restore us to God. And when we believe that word, it takes us places and that word goes places. And when we follow the word in our lives, we find those dividing lines and we find conflict and tension. And we're gonna examine five such fault lines in our passage today. If you've been around for Sovereign Hope, that's probably the most terrifying thing you've ever heard me say, that I have five points for us today. We hope to resolve them by Thursday. (laughs) Uh, Just to prepare you, lest you despair, we will be spending the majority of our time on the first two. And then, uh, by God's grace, we'll plow through the last three. (laughs) And so, as the gospel goes forward, we're going to see these five things. They're going to be on the screen right now. Don't worry about writing them down. This is just the flyover thing. They'll come up later. We're going to see those lines of peace and power, belief and belonging, Gift and gain, repentance and remorse, and confidence and confusion. Five points of tension that the word brings us to, but also that the word resolves. You see, nearly 1,700 years ago, one pastor famously said, reflecting on the history of the church, that the blood of the martyrs, the blood of the witnesses, the blood of the Christians, is the seed of the church. In other words, as Christians go forward with the word and preach the word, and as those Christians suffer and sometimes die, the church grows. Is that true? Our world, at different points in time, has wanted nothing more than for the church to die. Well, last time we were in the book of Acts, we read of the first Christian to die for his faith, Stephen. And our passage today begins in the immediate aftermath of Stephen being put to death because of the gospel. And it picks up in chapter 8, verse 1, saying, As Saul approved of Stephen's execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So we have seen persecution at various points in the book of Acts. There's been imprisonments and beatings and threats. But this marks a distinct point in the history of the church in Jerusalem. Here, for the first time, we see organized persecution and opposition. There's a man whose name is Saul, who will become a primary character moving forward, who has launched a campaign to get rid of the Christians. But as the blood flows and as the prisons begin to fill, the church grew. And this is the first fault line we see today, where peace and power rub up against one another. Peace and power. We just made it out of an election cycle, which both sides said that if somebody won, it would be the last election and the last day of human history, and we're here. We've made it. The earth is still under us. God is still on the throne. But the rhetoric from each side was this. If you want peace, give us the power. If you want peace, put us in a position of power, and we will make peace. Human power we believe, always leads to peace. But notice who has power in this passage. Go ahead and look at the first couple of verses of chapter 8 if you have your Bibles open. Pay attention to the words used in verse 1 and 2. Look at that word, great. What do Saul and the world have? They have whatever power it takes to make great persecution. And what is the great thing the church has? Great Lamentation. Kids, that means cries, sorrow, sadness. Who has great power? Well, Luke wants to draw us to the attention that it is the enemies of the church who have great power. And what do they want to do with that great power? Well, they attempt to get rid of the church. It was annoying. It was threatening to their way of life. It was calling them to account on their sin. It was disrupting the status quo. And so they were going to rid themselves of these believers and their annoying insistence upon the resurrection of Jesus. And they set themselves to use their great power to that end by causing, through persecution, the Christians to leave. And it was largely successful. Luke tells us that all of the disciples left 
except for the apostles. Maybe in the idea that the captains have to go down with the ship, perhaps because they're still trying to reason with these Jews. But from a worldly perspective, the power balance had swung greatly in their favor. They won the House, the Senate, the Judiciary Branch, the presidential thing, the color of the cars. They won everything (laughs) because they had isolated these apostles from the mass of their support. And they had sent these baby Christians, these new Christians out into the world without their great leaders. But notice what happens beginning in verse 4. Now those who were scattered, that is scattered by Saul's persecution, went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. And so to give a quick snapshot of what we see here is a principle that can clearly be stated. If you attempt to find peace Using the power of the world, you'll never find it. But if you walk in the power of God, you'll find peace everywhere you go, even when it doesn't seem to be peaceful. The world had all of the power. They had the power to dig up and destroy the dandelion of the church. But all their power managed to do was to take that glorious little fuzzball and blow those seeds and say, aha, no more dandelions. Their power failed to bring them the peace they wanted, and they had all of the power. And yet the church that was persecuted, that had no power, was being carried to the nations in a great way. You see, the gospel is not tied to a specific place or to a specific person outside of the person of Jesus Christ. And this means what the Bible presents to be true, that the gospel is wherever gospel Christians are. This tells us that everywhere Christians go, the power of the gospel goes. To remove Christians from Jerusalem doesn't remove the power of the gospel from Jerusalem. And to remove Christians from Jerusalem doesn't remove Christians from power. The gospel goes with the Christians in power. And here's that wonderful thing. They had finally isolated those dirty little apostles, the leaders, the ones who are doing these great miracles. But who's doing the work here? Ordinary Christians. Those who were scattered. Philip, who will follow for the next couple weeks, was just a servant in the church. One of the six chosen to wait tables. You know, if you're going to start an origin story for a superhero, it's not the busboy. But here's Philip, and what are they doing? They are proclaiming with great power the gospel of Jesus. And what is accompanying them? Great signs and spirits coming out of those who are possessed and great healing. You see, worldly power has the ability to displace you from your location. And the world at different points in different cultures has tried to displace Christians on that account. But the power of God never takes away your vocation. It never takes away what you're supposed to be doing. It never takes away your primary identity. Peer pressure and real persecution will try and move you out of your comfort zone. But for the Christian, our comfort zone is with God. And where are we with God? whenever we are with him in faith, wherever we are. I like to, I have anxiety. I've bred an anxious boy and it's just what we do in our home. We just get worried about stuff for fun. Um, And one thing I always tell him is like, uh, Owen, how do we know we're safe? He says, when we're with Jesus. How do I know when we're with Jesus? When we're obeying him and walking with him. Here is peace in the power of Christ. You see, these men and women left behind their lives in Jerusalem, but they did not leave behind their lives in Christ. You can take the Christian out of Jerusalem, but you can't take Christ out of the Christian. They lost their job. They lost family members. They did not lose what they were called to do. 
to glorify God and love others. The Bible would prohibit us from romanticizing persecution. It doesn't present it as something we must go and have. And yet what we see is that only a powerfully sovereign God is able to bring peace to a persecuted people. If you want peace, you must find it in God's power, not in the world's. You must find it in your Christian identity and purpose, not in anything else. And notice what the result of walking in the power of God was for these people who only had great lamentation. It wasn't just peace, but it was joy. Where they went, there was great joy in the city. The world's power was frustrated, but the church's power produced joy. And as those displaced refugees strolled into Samaria, the Samaritan church people didn't look at them and be like, oh, look at those pitiful wretches. They looked at them, they saw this otherworldly peace, and what did they do? They believed in it. And they had great joy. How evangelistic the peace of the church is when our peace is in Christ. And now Luke kind of double clicks on what's happening in Samaria. He picks up in uh, verse nine, he says this, but there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria saying that he himself was somebody great. And they all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news, about the kingdom of God, and in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Notice how God's peace sets us free from worldly power. Notice how we're introduced to this man named Simon in Samaria. And again, look at your Bible there. If you have it open, look at verses 9 through 12 and see how many times that word great shows up again. He was said to be somebody great. Everyone from the least to the greatest paid attention to him. That word paid attention is used twice, paid attention for a long time. Moreover, he was called the power of God that is called great. You see, records from church history uh, speak of this man and how he literally had these people spellbound. They were under his power, whether by his sleight of hand as a magician or perhaps by demonic influence in a genuine sort of way. But what breaks the power of the devil? What breaks the facade of man's magic? The preached message of a greater power, of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. As Christ was preached, true power prevailed. The spell was broken in the message of Jesus. There alone is the only power that can bring us peace. And it was so powerful and so profound that in verse 13, even Simon himself, the one who amazed many people, he himself is amazed. He believed. And so now as the church is going outside of Jerusalem, we have displaced religious refugees preaching a crucified Christ to a pagan magician and to Samaritan outsiders. And they are hearing and responding to the same message that was preached in Jerusalem and having faith in the same Jesus who is preached in Jerusalem. But now this leads to our second fault line, belief and belonging. True power was in the peace of God, but now we see another place of tension, belief and belonging. How did Simon belong to the church? How did the Samaritan believers belong to the church? Well, how do you belong to a group of people? And how do you know? How do you belong to a particular identity? Last night, there was a football game. It was easy to tell. Some people wore a specific color. Other people wore a specific color. In those instances, it's easy. The marks of belonging are clear. If you're a business professional, you might feel like you belong to your firm only when you can close that deal or only when you reach that benchmark. But then if someone else exceeds that benchmark, you know you have to exceed it to belong just as much as or even more than them. If you're a college student, you only belong to your peer group if you get that internship, if you get into the right honors college, if you attend the right kind of parties, if you make the right type of friends, 
you tweet the right kind of things, if you vote the right way. School-age kids, junior high, elementary, high school. You might feel like you can only belong to your friend group if you wear a specific style of clothes. Make bell bottoms great again. Or you treat certain groups of people certain ways. We don't talk to them because they're different than us. Therefore, you have to treat them a specific way if you're going to belong to us. But how does one belong to the church? How does one belong to God? What are the standards of acceptance there? Do we just get bumper stickers on our car? And that means you've done it. You belong. There's certainly more. And this is why Luke focuses on what seems to be kind of an odd aside in the book of Acts, beginning in verse 14. Now, when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them to Peter and John, or they sent them Peter and John. Now, notice how persecution doesn't remove apostles from Jerusalem, but the conversion of the lost does. It draws them out. Here is the joy of the gospel. Uh, So Peter and John, who have come down and prayed for them, that's the believers in Samaria, that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, if you've been with us through the book of Acts, this pattern that we see here of belonging is not the ordinary pattern, is it? See, Peter gives us the order of belonging and the marks of belonging, after he gives his Pentecost sermon. The Pentecost falls on um, the, the Jews and everyone looks and they're like, what's going on here? And then Peter preaches the message of the gospel and how this is the promise of God to fill his people with his spirit and everyone who watches is convicted of their sin and they say, what shall we do? And Peter says very clearly in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So there's the pattern. Repent, believe. That's what's signified in baptism. Baptism is used in the first four chapters of uh, Luke as a synonym for belief. Repentance and baptism is to say repentance and belief. Do those things, and what do you get? You get the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the true mark of Christians belonging to God. Paul calls it in the book of Ephesians, the seal and guarantee of our inheritance and of our salvation. But when do you get the Holy Spirit? Is it some subsequent thing that only super Christians get? Is it, do you need some holy man to lay hands on you? Do you need some second sort of baptism? Well, Paul again tells us there in Ephesians, he says that the church in Ephesus received the gospel when they, or received the Holy Spirit when they first believed the gospel. It was immediate. And when we see Christians come to faith in Jerusalem after Pentecost, there seemed to be this immediate response of belief, uh, faith, repentance, and the Holy Spirit. But what's unique here? There's a delay. They believe and they're baptized. We saw that in uh, the earlier part of chapter 8. But now there's this delay where the apostles come down and they pray for them. Why is that? What's going on here? Well, that's why it goes back to the issue of belonging. Uh, Most of you would hate to have me have you stand up and confess your sin, but most of you would probably hate more if I asked all the Californians to stand up. We're not sure what is more shameful. (laughs) If you've moved here from California, and I have a confession to make, I had the unfortunate reality of being born in California. My parents are both Montanans and made terrible decisions, and somehow we ended up there. But we've made our way back, and there's a way back for you too. Let's pray. But no, in real ways, it's actually odd, and it ought not be true in our church, that when individuals move here from California, they feel out of place. They feel like there's not enough they can do to belong. They feel like they'll always be at arm's length, and there's a narrative out there that Californians are moving here, and they're just ruining our state. They're making it just like the one they're running from. So take that tension that maybe you've heard in rumor, have you experienced in yourself, or perhaps that you've participated in, and multiply that a thousandfold. And you have the tension that would have existed between the Samaritans and the Jews. You see, God's people, Israel, split after David, King David in the Old Testament. 
And the 12 tribes were kind of broken up into two um, head tribes, two civil war tribes. In the south was the tribe of Judah. And they had Jerusalem. They're the ones to whom the promise of the Messiah was given. They're the ones who came back after their own exile and did the hard work of restoring the temple and building Jerusalem's walls in the face of all of this opposition. But then in the north, there was the tribe of Israel. And they too were conquered, but they didn't have the, the chutzpah it took to pull themselves back up by their bootstraps. Instead, they intermarried with all the foreign nations. They syncretized their faith There wasn't a return to Jerusalem movement. They didn't really love the Torah. And in fact, they not only synchronized their families, they synchronized their faith. They married outside of their family lines and they tried to take a little bit of what um, the Assyrians believed and to make it seem Jewish. And they actually set up alternative sites for their own Samaritan temple that was supposedly to Yahweh, their own special sites that was supposedly to Yahweh. And these tribes, this tribe of Israel, just became known as the Samaritans. They were so lost, they didn't have an identity anymore. They were so intermarried ethnically and religiously that they were loathed by the Jews. Same, both groups had opposition, but one did what it needed to. The other just folded up. They were called half-bloods. That's why Jesus uses for shock and awe the parable of the good Samaritan. Might as well be the good Californian. (laughs) They were absolutely loathed by the Jews. So the idea that these Samaritans, these racially fallen, disgusting, pagan half-Jews could be restored back into God's promise would have been absolutely offensive to the Jews in Jerusalem. But remember when the disciples in Acts chapter 1, right before Jesus is ascending, he's about to leave, and they're like, wait, 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 is now the time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? We're all here in Jerusalem. You did your thing. Now do we get Israel back? Well, Jesus didn't directly answer their question, if you remember, and said he actually tied it to their witness in the work of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8, Jesus said this. He said, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When will the kingdom be restored? Well, Jesus made it clear. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and when you go out with the message of salvation, and the disciples preach it in both Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The general pattern Peter gives of repentance in Acts chapter 2, repentance, belief in the Holy Spirit is the norm throughout the whole book of Acts, throughout the New Testament with a few exceptions. The first exception is when these believing Jews were gathered after Jesus' resurrection and ascension in Jerusalem. And there was a delay until the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell on the Jewish church for the very first time. The second exception is when these first believers in Judea and Samaria believed and the apostles came and with great power and signs, the Holy Spirit fell. The third exception is when Cornelius, the Gentile Roman soldier, is converted, the one from the ends of the world. And they pray and he receives the Holy Spirit in a powerful way. Everyone gets a Pentecost. (laughs) Jerusalem, the faithful Jews, Judea and Samaria, the half-bloods and the fallen ones, and the whole world. And that goes to show that that one-time miracle that shows that God has done his work. What we just read in Ezekiel 37, that God had promised to restore all of Israel. He was not just satisfied with the faithful who rebuilt the temple because we don't need rebuilt temples. We don't need rebuilt walls. We need rebuilt hearts, both Jews and Samaritans and Gentiles. And Jesus has come to do just that without exception. That's why the apostles went to verify this. One, to show that the promise of God was even for Samaritans and the other to go back home and be like, no, 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 they really believed they really were saved. 
they have been restored to God, not by their own works of reconciling themselves to us, not by by throwing down the false temples they had made in the immediate, they were restored by what? By their faith in the message of Jesus. And when their faith in baptism was confirmed, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. The promise was fulfilled. And if you want to be restored to God, that's the promise you need too. And this is important for us because you can belong in myriads of ways to multiple things, but you can only belong to God and to God's church by belief in Jesus. That's it. There is no other standard of belonging. The world's standards are always changing, and you've got to meet those terms. There's a great book written by D.A. Carson. It's called uh, the, uh, the Intolerance of Tolerance. The world says, hey, belong however you want to belong. But that is incredibly disgraceful to anyone who thinks there's another way of belonging. (laughs) It's in essence saying, all of your ways are wrong, my way is right, come and listen like me. Turns out you've invented exclusivity. (laughs) But here, we can actually know for certain. That's why the church is always the most diverse place because you don't have to be from a certain place. You don't have to make a certain amount of money. You don't have to look a certain way. You don't have to talk a certain way. You have to come to that one savior who redeems us by that same act of grace. And we are baptized into this wonderfully diverse fellowship of the church. That's how you belong. And to have all of those things is to truly belong. To have the spirit and to have the fellowship of the church. Even though all of us are still works in progress. All of us are still figuring out what it looks like to walk faithfully in light of what Christ has done. And if you want to know more about what that looks like to belong to God and to his church, I would encourage you to sign up for our church essentials class on December 8th. That's where we dive more fully into what it means to belong to Christ and what it looks like to belong here in the context of the church. We're not saved because we belong to a church. We're saved because we belong to Jesus. What we see here is that when those who belong to Jesus do so by faith, they also belong to the church of Jesus. All right, those are the first two. I promise the rest is not going to be as long. And so here we see our third fault line, gift and gain, gift and gain. Simon uh, professes faith and is baptized, and yet he's shown to have a fundamental misunderstanding of the faith that he's claiming to believe in. And Luke draws our attention to that in verses 18 through 21, where we read this. Now, when Simon saw that the spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. You see, when it comes to what we fear and what we expect, everyone fears that external fault line of persecution. Everyone fears Saul coming into your city and saying, if you believe in Jesus, I'm going to persecute you. But we often miss the more dangerous fault line, which is the fault line that goes in our own hearts. The fault line of thinking you can belong apart from belief. You see, Simon did the visible things. He audibly said words that he believed in. He was physically made wet with water. He followed Philip. But his heart saw the gospel as something he could gain for himself instead of the free gift of God. His life here in this passage shows that he had no understanding of what it was he claimed to believe in because his hope was in things beyond faith. Simon was amazed. We saw that. But his amazement was misplaced. He was amazed that Philip was doing this kind of stuff. He didn't see Jesus as a gift given by faith to the needy. Instead, he saw Jesus as a path to regain his own greatness. It's my interpretation of looking at all of this that Simon's unbelieving heart is shown most fully in that he didn't get the Holy Spirit. My guess is that if he was one of these that had received the Holy Spirit when the apostles prayed, like we see Simon's heart here. He wouldn't have went and asked for permission. He would have just started trying to do this on his own, trying to gain his own greatness back. And that's why Peter responds so harshly. Because Simon should be first concerned that he himself has the Holy Spirit. Not because Simon needed the extra juju of Christianity, 
but because the Spirit is essential to Christianity. Paul says that if anyone does not have the Spirit, they do not belong to Jesus. So to want even the gift of the Holy Spirit, to want even the community of the church, to want something about Christianity that is not Jesus is to miss the essence of it. It's to miss the gift we have in Christ and Christ alone. There are no false conversions in the church. When God saves a dead heart and brings them to life through the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and fills them with the Holy Spirit, they will endure in their faith. But while there are no false conversions, there are sometimes false converts like Simon. There are those who think God has done a work and they think that they have responded properly, but their lives show that they have no understanding of what they claim to believe in. There are those who want in their salvation what they seem to have given up in their conversion. They want in their salvation what they seem to have given up in their conversion. Remember, it was Simon who previously held everyone's attention in Samaria. He was great. But what happened when Philip and the gospel came? Everyone started paying attention to Philip. Everyone started paying attention to this great gospel. But here, through the greatness of the Holy Spirit, here's his own path back to greatness. Here's the way he will regain his own story and still feel good about it as if he's pleasing God in the process. He wanted, when he asked for power here, it's not the same word we saw earlier. It's a unique word that means authority. He wanted the authority to command the Holy Spirit and to give it to others. He wanted his own glory back. But our greatest gain is the gift of our salvation. We are placed under God's authority. Notice how not even the apostles claimed to have authority over the Holy Spirit. How did they respond here? They didn't summon him. They didn't command him. They didn't make demands of him. Instead, they confirmed the faith of the believers, and then they prayed to God that they, the believers, might be filled with the Holy Spirit. And God, who has the power, and God, who has the authority, did everything that God promised to do. Make no mistake, we give up a lot in coming to Christ. And our tendency will be to use Christ as the tool wherein we attempt to regain our own greatness, our own power, our own lives, and our own position. But Christ and our conversion and the gift of the Holy Spirit and the restoration to the Father is our gain. Godliness with contentment, Paul says, is great gain. He goes on to rebuke those who think that they could use it to get something else. And I wonder how many of us, if we're honest, use our salvation to purchase back what was lost instead of using our salvation and walking in light of it, in light of what we've already been given, that we already have everything and therefore we don't need anything. May we say with the psalmist, Who have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth I desire besides you. The glory of Christianity is Christ and his glory and his greatness. And you cannot gain anything better than that. So come to Christ. The fourth fault line is seen in Simon's response. And this is repentance and remorse. Notice specifically Peter's call to action. So pay attention to his words and then notice the deafness of Simon's response. Picking up in verse 22, Peter says this, repent therefore of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. The gospel of Jesus Christ crosses racial lines, gender lines, political lines, and national borders. Christians are diverse, but Christianity is not. There are not multiple strains of Christianity. 
Well, we must be wise in our own time, in our own culture, to use language appropriate with our culture. The message of Christianity is the same. Repent and believe in Jesus. As in Jerusalem, so in Samaria. As in Missoula, so in Montreal. Repent and seek the Lord's forgiveness. That is the message of the gospel. It is beyond culture. It will never change. Repent and believe. And at this point, Simon is caught. And notice how devastating this would have been to him. What is he seeking this whole way? The way to gain back his own public greatness. All he wants is public praise, but what did he get instead? Public rebuke. Right? He wanted to dazzle people, and instead, Peter, before all, rebuked him. His heart was laid open, and his heart was not great. And maybe you've been there before thinking you know what's going on, thinking you've worked things in your own favor, only to find out that what's been exposed is instead your own heart. I know I've felt that. When other people see the true Tyler, the Tyler who's in his flesh, not the Tyler who's in Christ, it's a gross thing. And no one likes that. And most of us would do anything to try and avoid that experience. But notice here how remorse over that experience is not the same as biblical repentance. What's the difference between remorse and repentance? Well, remorse does what Simon did. It stops with how man sees you. But repentance is more concerned with how God sees us. Notice how this is demonstrated for us in the text. What did Peter tell Simon to do in verse 22, if you have your Bibles open? Repent, therefore, and pray to the Lord. Now look at verse 24. How did Simon respond? Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you said may have come upon me. He doesn't get it. He can't get his eyes past himself or past man. He doesn't care what God said. (laughs) He only cares what Peter said. And he doesn't care that he needs to go and repent to God. He's saying, Peter, you go do that for me. I want you to know that I'm truly sorry about what happened. He tells Peter to pray on his behalf. And that's the difference between remorse and repentance. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7.10 that godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. You see, when we realize that our sin is first and foremost against God, we realize that there is only one man who can do something about it, and that is God himself. We need Jesus Christ, the God-man. We can spend the whole of our lives trying to earn the favor of the Peters in our world, trying to make ourselves look better, trying to, to mope and to sulk of like, man, I wish I would have done better. But guess what? You don't need the affirmation of man. Your sin is bigger than that. If all you need to do is to save face, you don't need to repent to God. You need a good PR campaign. If all you need is good health, you don't need to repent to God. You need a better diet and exercise. If all you need is worldly wealth, you don't need to repent to God. You need better budgeting and a college degree. But if you need to be saved from your sin, you must repent to God. There is only one thing in this whole world that deals with our heart, and it's the one who died for it. It's coming to Jesus. When we feel remorse, may it lead us to repentance. May it lead us to the only person who can do something about it. When we realize the size of our sin, then we see the need for grace and grace alone. As the old hymn says, might I hide my blushing face while his dear cross appears. Dissolve my heart in thankfulness and melt my eyes to tears, but drops of tears can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. And here we see our final fault line, confidence and confusion confidence and confusion. I know in this room that there are people in here who wonder, am I Simon? Am I the one who has all of the visible, as it relates to man, markers of conversion, and yet I will be one who is turned away and perish? 
And the unfortunate reality is, is that some of you in here might be. Just as Philip did, just as the apostles did, we in the church, in our church membership process, try to make sure that those who are called members are genuine members, but we cannot see your heart. And being added to the church does not mean you have been added to Christ. Only God sees the heart, which is why we need the warning of Peter. And if you think this is you, then this passage is not meant to confuse you. It's not meant to make you fearfully anxious. Instead, it's, cause, it's, it's meant to cause you the great confidence of knowing what it is you are to do. Pray to the Lord that he might forgive you. We can confidently no longer focus on trying to assess how repentant am I? How faithful am I? How serious am I? Instead, we go with serious faith and repent. And we come to God and we know he is faithful because there is the power of God. There is the glory of Jesus. And we do this whether for the first time or for the 5,000th time because we know that it's only repentance that leads us to life. And God forgives repentant sinners. You see, Simon told, or Peter told Simon that you have neither part nor lot in this matter. What does he mean, matter? Well, that word matter is the same word used in other places. In the Greek, it's just logos which means word. In other words, he's saying, you have neither part nor lot in this word. He's not believing the word. If you look back through this passage, notice all the times the word is doing the work. The word is being proclaimed. The word is being preached. The word is being believed. The word is being received. The word is being paid attention to. Philip is not suffering from some hidden, undiscernible sin. He's suffering from not believing the word. (laughs) That's it. It's that simple which is why Luke includes this verse at the end in verse 25. Now when they had testified and spoken to the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. If you are anxious and if you are confused and you know not what to do, the word always wins. The word does the work. Hear the word. Repent and believe. We have fault lines running straight through our heart and straight through our world, but this has come so that you might not be caught off guard. This might come so that regardless of that point of tension, regardless of how hidden or obvious it is, we might know how to navigate through it with the word. One dear brother once told me the best we have as Christians is faith and repentance. You can try and guess where those fault lines are and live in constant fear. You can try and hope that God will accept you that one day based off some good theological answer you might give him. Or you can hope that you could satisfy yourself in the world long enough that you will be deeply satisfied when it seems all things have come to an end. Or you can let the Bible make sense of your life. You can let this guide your way by leading you to Christ. I love how John Calvin says it. He said he'd rather limp along the path of scripture than sprint with all speed outside of it. Here is where we walk. Here is where we make sense of our life. The message of salvation will take you into pinch points in times of tension, but the message of Christ is also our deepest hope for navigating those for our own joy, our own confidence, and the glory of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you work this word into our hearts that you show us how conflicted our hearts are, and yet you show us how simple repentance is and how powerful the gospel is. We pray that we are a people who navigate well the trials of this world and therefore carry your gospel faithfully into every context, into every heart, because we have heard the word. And may us as the church seek to accept those whom you accept and encourage them as we walk along this path. We pray all this in your name. Amen.